Hello, everyone. Let's see who else gets on here in a minute. <laughs> Here's Sissy. Hi, Anna. Hi, Natasha. Uh. Hi, Amanda. Does anybody have any prayer requests? Hi, Adrian. Hi, Lydia. Does anybody have any prayer requests? Alrighty, let's start with the prayer. Father God, Thank you for this day. I'm lifting up the youth to you today and forever. Show them that there should be no fear that you are here. They need to turn to you for any guidance when they have any kind of type of fear. Or lifting up Amanda's Uncle Tony, he's very sick. They think it might be COVID-19. We're lifting him up right now to you, Father God. We know that you are so powerful that you could just wipe that this off the face of the earth. Thank you for everything that you have done in Amanda's life. We're lifting up Billy right now to you, Father God. He's out on the road. We need protection for all of our truck drivers. They're going in dangerous places, areas, states. We need to lift up Billy to you. And Anna is asking for normal life again. She wants to go back to normal. I think she's bored. <laughs> I think everybody else is bored. Um, we're lifting up Anastasia to you. Father God, you know what's going on, what she needs provision and stuff with. Thank you for everything that you have done in our lives and that we love you and we thank you. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I went around and gave everybody a paper. You guys could take these out and get your jelly beans out. <clears throat> okay, so it's the colors of Easter. So, green. Green is for the palms they waved at him as he entered into Jerusalem. And your purple is for the wine he poured and blessed before he faced his final test. Red is for the precious blood he shed from the crown of thorns placed on his head. Black is for the sky as he died on the cross, suffering the redeem our loss. 
And then there's the pink one and the yellow one and the orange one are for the dawn that morn when the tomb was empty and hope was reborn. And final, the white is for the dazzling light that awed all who saw him arisen, Son of God. Those are what the jelly beans stand for, for Easter. What do you all think about that? Okay, and then the second paper that I gave to you guys is how to choose faith over fear. It's a choice every be believer can't avoid. Either we are walking in faith of fear, faith in the face of fear stretches us to grow up spiritually. In Romans 10, 17, we recognize that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the world about Christ. Oh, what's going on? Oh, you want to sort through them by colors? I was asking too. <laughs> and so, in order to build our faith, we must broaden our knowledge, understanding, and application of God's Word. The following five steps reveal how to choose faith over fear with the Holy Scriptures. <clears throat> so step one, know the word. Teach me knowledge and good judgment for I just, oh, for I trust your commands. That's Psalms 119, 66. Which question, Amanda? Adrian was asking, are we going to sort them? Because we usually do. So I think Adrian was asking if we was going to sort through all the jelly beans. So we are reading how to choose faith over fear, and we're on step one, know the word. So knowing the word is teach me knowledge and good judge, judgment, for I trust your com your commands. And that is on in Psalms 119.66. <clears throat> Knowing God's word is the foundation and beginning of choosing faith over fear. Our knowledge of the Bible can be a deciding factor in the strength or weakness of our faith. It's our knowing what God's word says, says that gives us the courage to bodily stretch our faith in trusting God for the impossible. 
We look to the example of our forefathers and foremothers in the faith as a testimony that God is able to help us overcome our fears in adversity. Step two is obey the word. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his, fa- and his faith was made complete by what he did. And then you can find that in James 2.22. We must commit ourselves to obey God's word for our actions. Our practice of obeying God's word gives us confident when we are confronted by fear. Fear can be paralyzing, but faith is energizing when we put God's word into action. The more we step out in faith in obedience to word of God with a pure heart, the more our faith grows in the Lord and we are less afraid of the unknown. Step three, speak the word. No. The word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. Deuteronomy 30, 14. There are times we need to simply speak out loud what the Bible teaches in the face of fear. Fear breeds on our doubts in the silence of our thoughts. Yet, in contrast, our faith is strengthened and grows out of our spoken confidence confidence of God's truth. There's something about repeating the Holy Scriptures that helps us to push forward when we want to give up. We speak the words within and out loud, bolstering our faith and quieting our fears. Step four, pray pray the word. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. First Timothy four four five. Some of the best prayers we can pray come straight from the Bible. Prayers of Moses, David, Daniel, and Paul, and best of all, Jesus, serves as great examples of how to get our faith over the mountain of fear. Many of of the cries out to God in the book of Psalms were written in desperate, fearful times causing the author to remember the goodness and grace of God. We can also search the scriptures for the promises of God to build our faith up when we are feeling low. Praying God's word on a daily basis builds a fortitude of faith that crushes fear. Step 5. Live the word. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4 4. A believer who knows, obeys, speaks, and prays the word of God will live it out in faith and not fear. The choice of faith becomes easier as we become overwhelmingly confident that God will do as he says in his word. Fear just isn't a a viable option. As we live out our faith, the Holy Spirit brings a greater assurance in our hearts. Through a renewed hope in God, we become more attuned to his will and unafraid to move in his direction. 
It is through the constant use of God's word that matures our faith to the point where faith is no longer the deciding factor in our lives. <coughs> Choose faith. We know that fear brings torment, but perfect perfect love drives it away as we long for the word of God more than our necessary physical food. His love will be perfected in our hearts. The faith within our hearts builds from the foundation of love from God. Faith based on the teaching, reading, and hearing of the Bible has the best possibility of overcoming fear. By choosing the word of God, we choose faith over fear. What do you think about that one? So we've been reading a book of Stomping Out Fear. We're on chapter three. Chapter three is Overcoming the Fear of Man. Okay, the fear of God is the one fear that destroys all unhealthy fears. That is true, Amanda. <laughs> the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Proverbs twenty nine twenty five. We are living in bondage if we fear man more than God. What is actually holding us in bondage, though? Is our own lack of knowledge and belief in God? The fear of man is a stronghold that must be broken in order for us to experience the freedom to live as Jesus did. In the following testimony, notice how a stronghold of fear was developed. <coughs> so, when I was 11, my family moved to an upscale town in New York that was pre predominantly white. The folks there weren't used to living next to blacks. I remember standing at a water fountain in the sixth grade and having a classmate ask me if I had a tail. I remember walking past a school bus and having a boy hold up a drawing of a man with a noose around his neck and scream that it was me. I recall being so starved for acceptance that I thought it was a compliment when someone told me, we don't consider you to be a nigger. We are different. Against this backdrop was a dysfunctional home where my mother filled my head with lies. She told me I was gay because I didn't date. She said I was stupid because my grades stunk. She, gra she guaranteed that I would die by the time I turned 16 because my life was so f futile. This hostile shaped, hostility shaped my view of myself. By the time I was 18, I was so stripped of confidence that I couldn't look a person in the eye. I was filled with doubt and fear, and I struggled with a poor self-image. A deep-seated insecurity and fear of man can form in our lives when negative labels are slapped onto our souls at a young age. 
like scarlet scarlet letters these labels broadcast our faults or someone's perception of our faults to the world around us a sense of personal shame and infor- infertility breaks our spirit in the testimony above it is obvious how a young man such as this would fear rejection from people he experienced the sting of racial slurs his mother instead of affirming him called him gay and stupid and told him his life was futile and he was doomed to die young Like a puppy brutally whipped, he learned at an early age that it is easier to steer clear of people and not make waves than it is to risk being ridiculed and rejected. When I hit puberty, I thought I had contracted a terminal illness. Almost overnight, my body declared civil war against me. My face broke out, my teeth stuck out, so I had to endure the private prison of braces. And my height and weight went in one year from 5'6", 6 inches, and 120 pounds, to 6 feet and 120 pounds. I wasn't skinny. I was... Skeletal, I become a confident target. I became a confident target for other insecure kids at school who were glad to find someone in worse shape than they were. At first, I tried to fight back against the snares and rude comments of my peers, but after a while, I gave up. Feeling ganged up on by the world, I was drew in fear and shame tired of walking out of the lunch line and finding no one to eat with in the cafeteria i choose to bring my lunch to school and eat in a vacant classroom by myself it was a very sad and lonely time of life i retreat i retreated into my I retreated into my own little world. I felt increasingly angry against the establishment that had created such an unfair system of acceptance and rejection based on physical appearance. (laughs) My fear of rejection of rejection by people drove me deeper and deeper into myself. Without Christ, there was only darkness inside. Yeah. My room became my only safe place, and it might have become my tomb if not for Jesus. My story and the one preceding it are examples of how the fear of man can put a strangle stranglehold on the life of a person without Christ. But children of God also struggle under the efforts of this stronghold as well, especially when we confess our expectations and what others expect of us with God accepts from us. Only one Le- legitimate fear objects. We become subject to the fear of man when we are not secure in secure in the unconditional love and acceptance of God. Also, it's easy to forget that God is omnipresent everywhere and omnipotent all-powerful when confronted by various fear objects we can see because God is invisible. 
That is why we need to worship him. When we ascribe to him his divine attributes in worship, we are keeping our minds filled with the knowledge of his presence. God drove this point home when he corrected his people through the pro- prophet Isaiah for their f- faithfulness in the face of human enemies. I, even I am, he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies and of the son of the man who is made like grass? That you have forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth, that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor. As he makes ready to to destroy, but where is the fury of the oppressor? It's Isaiah fifty one twelve and thirteen. In these verses, God presents the huge difference between man and himself. The bottom line is that people live and die like grass, but God is the creator of heaven and earth, including grass. Why be afraid of man who can only harm you for a limited time when God is the eternal, all-powerful comforter, a legitimate fear objects has to be both present and powerful, as we saw in the in the fear factor. As long as we live on planet Earth, people will be present. But what power do they have over us that cannot be overcome in Christ? None. We may be rejected by people, but we will always be choice of precious in the light of God. 1 Peter 24. Feel the fear, but trust in God. Oh. Fear of man and faith in God cannot be operative at the same time. We will always struggle with with tempting thoughts and fearful feelings, but they do not have to keep us from making the choice with our with our will to walk by faith in God. That is courage, making the choice to walk by faith and do what's right, even in the face of fear. Being alive and free in Christ doesn't mean that we will never feel fear. It means that such fears no longer have any power over us if we exercise our faith in God. There will be times when you will be afraid or hesitant to speak the truth in love and the fear of man will motivate you to lie to others giving in to those fears will only compound the bondage paul tells us to to lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit and he renewed in the spirit of the mind and put on the new shelf which in the likeness of god has been created in righteousness and holiness of the of the truth therefore laying aside falsehood speak truth each one of you with his neighbor for we are members of one another ephesians Four twenty-two twenty-five. If you are afraid to say no when God has said no, you are a servant of man. 
the Apostle Paul said to, said of himself, Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Gillians, Gillitans 1, 10 you cannot serve two masters trying to keep from ruffling the feathers of those around you will eventually cause you to compromise, compromise your stand for Christ. The Courage to Share Paul preached the gospel of grace knowing that it ran cross-current to the preaching of the Jewish religious religious leaders who wanted to bring new genital genitals converts under the yoke of the law. The last verse was Ephesians four twenty two twenty five. Paul forcelessly attacked their faith teaching, teaching, and took some painful shots while protecting the church from hearsay. How many believers are scared in scared into silence when they ought to be proclaiming from the rooftops what God has done for them in Christ? How many times do we sense the inner urging of the Spirit of God to witness for Christ, but we keep quiet with the excuse that we don't want to appear pushy, preachy, or insensitive? Sensitive. Let me see. Okay. Do we value our own safety and security more than the soul of another person most of us would em emphatically say no but when an opportunity arises to share our faith we are paralyzed by fear where does that fear come from god has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and power and of love and of a sound mind second timothy 1 7 phobias drain our power and make physically strong people feel weak and paralyzed they take away love for another's and drive and and drive us into a whirlpool pull of self centeredness fear of mankind is mutual exclusive of the love of mankind love is self-giving but fear is self-protecting love moves us towards others fear causes us to shrink from others Fear steals our wisdom and clear thinking and replaces it with confusion and error. Dr. Bill Bright's personal life and ministry as founder and president of Campus Crusades for Christ is a testimony of the power of the Holy Spirit in witnessing. In his best-selling book witnessing with witnessing without fear he wrote witnessing for our lord is something we all know we should do yet witnessing is an activity we frequently shrink from to in introduce to intrude in someone else's life seems not only threatening but blatantly 
presumptuous. We fear offending the other person, fear being rejected, fear doing an inadequate job for rep representing our Lord, and even being branded a fanatic. In the chapter, Why More Christians Don't Witness, Dr. Bright suggests three main reasons for believers timidly in evangelism, spiritual lethargy, not being filled with the Spirit because of sin, lack of proper training, and listening to the devil's lies. It stands to reason that if the gospel is the power of God for salvation, then the enemy will do all he can to keep God's people from being the ambassadors he has called them to be. Satan is the father of lies, and if we believe him, we will keep silent. The truth will set us free, but lies will keep us in bondage. Here are some of the specific lying lines the enemy tries to feed us according to Dr. Bright. Mind your own business. You don't have any right to force your views on someone else. You are going to offend this person. Don't say anything. That person will think you're a fanatic. This person will say no and you'll be embarrassed. Notice that each one of the devil's lies is targeted at our own insecurities. We naturally want other people to like and respect us. We feel more comfortable when things are peaceful, free of conflict or controversy. And so far, too often, we keep quiet or we talk about everything under the sun except Jesus and our faith in him. Oh. This is Casey's story. April 20th, 1999 started like any other day. Casey Burnell slipped on her beloved velvet Doc Martens, grabbed her backpack, and headed out the door through the back yard, over the fence, across the soccer field, in, soccer field to high school which was only a hundred yards away. Little did Casey know that she was about to enter a battle zone. In a short time, the whole campus would be cordoned, cordoned off and surrounded by an army of police and SWAT teams. Just before 11 a.m., an explosion ripped through Calabine High School and shots began to fill the normally s serene atmosphere. Casey was in the library studying Macbeth for an English class. She had only been there for a short time when a teacher bolted in yelling that there were kids with guns in the hall. One of the teachers yelled for everyone to get under the tables but no one was listening. It didn't seem to make sense. As the shots down the hall grew closer, one of the teachers found a phone and called 911. Two boys, one named Eric and the other Dylan, came into the, into the library. Their, voice, their voices sounded scary and evil. At the same time, they seemed happy like they were playing a game and getting a kick kick out it they were knocking over tables and chairs then more shooting started one of the guys came up to casey they asked her one simple question do you believe in god 
she paused only for a moment, then uttered, then uttered with sign, signally clarity, yes. They put the gun to her head and pulled the trigger. When the grisly events of that spring day were finally over, Casey Barnell's body was found lying under a table close to the close to that of another young girl. The blast that ended her life had taken her away, instantly transporting her from this life to the next. What kind of mastery mystery of her emotions did Casey have? What kind of bravery cat cap Activated her mind, allowing her to state so clearly her fatal identification with her God. <clears throat> if you were faced with Casey's question, the ultimate question, would you identify with Christ? Got a plug in my phone. Where did I go? Would you overcome your fear to proclaim your faith? I believe you would, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world to sacrifice your life for the cause of Christ. To be a martyr is almost the greatest sacrifice you as a Christian can make. But there is one sacrifice that is greater. That is to live each and every day for the cause of Christ and proclaim with boldness God's means of salvation through Christ alone. Oh. Got it. Give me a few minutes. Sorry. Oh, okay. How about that? So what do we have to gain? As long as we perceive that somebody or something has the power to destroy everything we value, we will be in bondage to that fear object and that fear will paralyze us into a life of compromise or withdrawal the coward always asks what do i stand to lose the courageous person like casey barnell always asks what do i stand to gain one sees the risk the other sees the opportunity look at david in First Samuel 17. King Samuel and his soldiers were drawn up by uh, drawn up for battle against the Philistines in the valley of Eli. Each side of each side was stationed on a mountain with the valley in between. The Philistine warrior Goliath, all nine feet nine inches of him issued a challenge to the Israelites. He would fight a Hebrew soldier one on one, and whoever killed his opponent would bring victory for the whole army, and the losing side will serve the winners. Goliath issued his blasphemous challenge to the Israelites army for 40 days. Here is how God's people responded. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. Verse 24. The young shepherd boy David, however, had enough courage to take on the challenge. Armed only with his slingshot and five smooth rocks, he prepared for battle. Samuel 
offered his own armor to David, believing the boy needed man's help to win God's battle. David knew better. In his young life, he had already killed a lion and a bear. The giant would be no more trouble than they were because he knew God was his rescuer. David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Verse 37. So David confidently went out to meet Goliath and prevailed over him with a sling and a stone, cutting out the giant's head with his own giant sword. Why was David willing to willing and able to take on Goliath with no with no one else was? Well, when no one else was, King Saul and his men saw themselves in relation to the giant and trembled. David saw Goliath in relation to God of triumph. There was no question in the young shepherd's mind that God would deliver this Philistine warrior into his hands. That is true. Could David have been killed? Of course, but that did not seem to even be an issue for him. He knew that his life was ultimately in God's hands, not Goliath's. He valued his relationship with God more than his own life and in, and in David's eyes. God's glory was at stake for him life was nothing life was nothing compared to the glory of god and so there was no other alternative than to fight for the honor and name of his king a higher calling the apostle paul said to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1 21. Put an, anything else in the formula and it doesn't work. To me to live is my Xbox. To die would be total loss. To me to live is my snowboard. To die would be total loss. Being free from the fear of death is not a license to commit suicide. It is a means to live responsibly today. Someone once said, there is only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what has been done for Christ will last. Your God will bring you through anything that life can throw at you. You can face life with boldness and courage, even when you are put under some spiritually challenging times. The following true story shows fear is really a challenge to God and his strength. And it shows how God will always provide the courage we need to face each day. Stand firm and trust. Seven young evangelists sailed to the island village of Miha. The group was led by Watchman Ni, later one of China's greatest Christian leaders. Despite great effort, they were ignored by the villagers. Finally, the youngest, Ku Wa-Ching Li, shouted to a crowd in frustration, 
What's wrong with you? Why don't you believe? Oh, we do believe. Come back. It came, came back a reply. We believe in our God, Taiwan. He never fails us. Ku Ching learned that the village staged a great festival for their God every year. For the last 286 years, it had not rained on that festival day. And the celebration was only two days away on January 11th. And positively, he announced, I promise you, our God, who is the true God, will make it rain on the 11th. The crowd took up his, his challenge. When Watchman Nee Nay, heard about it, he was very troubled and went away to pray. The phrase from Second Kings 2.14 came to his mind. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He remembered the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. First Kings 18. Convinced that God was going to do going to do a miracle. Oh. Watchman's told his friends to tell everyone that the Lord God of Elijah would send rain on January 11th, a day on which it hadn't rained in almost three centuries. One, oh, centuries. On the morning of that day, the sun rose in a cloudless sky. The villagers were assured that Tai Wong was the true God after all. Terribly distressed, watchmen began to pray, Lord, this doesn't look like the rain that look like the rain that you suddenly his prayer was interrupted by the phrase where is the Lord God of Elijah as watchmen rose and joined the others over breakfast he simply prayed father please accept our prayer as a gentle reminder that you promised to answer the challenge of, of the demon God, God today even though not a cloud appears in the sky, we trust in your promise. Before he could say amen, they heard a few drops hit the tilled, tilled roof. The villagers hurried to protect their idol, ho hoisting him onto a platform to be carried down the streets. And as the false priest tried to carry their statue away. It crashed to the ground, breaking his arm and head. When the storm finally stopped, the head priest quickly fixed the idol and announced that, he'll, that he'd made a terrible mistake. The annual celebration was to have fallen on January 14th, not on January 11th. Lord, Lord, watchman prayed, give us good weather till then. We have a lot to do. Over the next three days, the men evangelized night and day, and 30 villagers confessed Christ. When the correct day came, at the very same hour as before, another huge moonsen hit Maiha. From that moment, Pegna's hold on the island was broken. A church was started, and the faith of the seven young men was dramatically strengthened for their upcoming year in God's work.
it would have been easy for the other six evangelists to become fearful and, sim and simply leave the island after they, they had heard about the rash challenge that Ko Jing Li had made to the pagan leaders, the pagan leaders, but instead they prayed and asked God, what's your will? What's your plan? Fear often gives us an opportunity to prove that God is faithful and loving. Be careful not to put him to the, to the test. But when fear rears its ugly head, we have every right to stand firm and put our trust in God who has overcome all our fears. So, so here, stomping out fear. Reflect. It's a uh, says read Romans eight thirty one thirty nine. So I have to go get my Bible. Give me a minute. Come on. So have everybody turn to Romans 8. Uh, Romans 8. Thirty-one to thirty-nine. What then shall we say? Oh, it's a God's everlasting love. <laughs> what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. How shall he not he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who who is he who con, condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of god who also makes intercessions for us inter intercession who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or fa famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for your sake we are killed all day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am prosecuted Persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor princi principalities, nor powers, nor things pre present, nor things to come, nor height nor death nor any other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> yeah, she's a little cutie-pa-duty. 
So reflect. <laughs> Thanks, Selena. Reflect. So we encourage you to do some prayerful soul searching. Ask the Lord to show you any fears that you have of man and why. Pray that he would reveal the nature of the hold people have over you. In what ways are you finding it hard to entrust yourself to God who judges righteously? The first thing we can do we oh sorry the first thing we do about anything is go to god in prayer tell him openly and honestly who you are afraid of he already knows but you need to be the agreement with need to be in agreement with him ask him for wisdom wisdom to discern why you are afraid second make sure you are right with your heavenly father have you resolved all your personal and spiritual conflicts are you more afraid of the voice of man than you are the voice of god what fear objects have you evaluated above the fear of god it is not a sin to feel afraid, but if the fear of man is controlling you, then God is not. Third, worship God for who he is. Ascribe to him his divine attributes of omnipotence, all powerfulness and omnipresence, everywhereness. Acknowledge the truth of his word. Thank him for his unconditional love and acceptance and for his promise for provision and protection. Fourth, make an honest assessment of what harm people can do to you. This is where your life is tested. Either God is able to make up for that others have taken away, or he isn't. If you believe he is more than able to meet your needs, you can walk by faith, even in the face of man's cruelty. If you doubt that he can or will, then fear will rule. Fifth. Remember that none of your pain or suffering has gone unnoticed by your Father in heaven. He knows your needs and hears your prayers. Finally, stand firm in your faith, knowing that God is with you. You are his child. He will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able to bear but will always provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure. See first Christ, Christian Wow. See first Corinthians ten thirteen. <laughs> Entrust yourself into his hands, for he truly judges righteously. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. respond let psalms 56 1 9 provide the framework for your prayer for freedom from the fear of man be gracious to me O god for man has trampled upon me fighting all day long he oppresses me my foes have trampled upon me all day long for they are many who fight proudly against me when i am afraid i will put my trust in you in god whose word i praise in god i have put my trust i shall not be afraid 
What can mere man do to me? All day long they destroy my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited to take my life. Because of wickedness, cast them forth. In anger, put down the peoples. O oh God, you have taken account for my wanderings. Wanderings, yeah. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that is God for me. So that is your chapter. So what do you guys think about fear and fear controlling? Do you guys think fear is controlling you right now? If so, turn to the word. God will not let you sit here and suffer. Ask him for help to get through this. So let's pray. Lord, Father God, we are asking to lift up our youth right now in all their fears of what's going on with the coronavirus. Show them that there is no fear to turn to you. You will protect them and that you love us all and you won't let no harm happen to us at all. Oh, Father God, thank you for everything that you have done. Thank you for everything, Father God. As I say these things in your precious and holy name, we love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You have been more, more, more bored. Well, that's better than being scared, right? <laughs> well, hopefully we get to see each other very, very soon face to face, you guys. I love you guys. Talk to you guys later.